So it's uh, happy to be here with everybody. Uh, thanks for taking a little bit of time of your day. What we are going to talk about is problem definition and maybe how it uh, approach how you can approach it from a variety of different perspectives. I know everybody's kind of in different places with uh, their own personal circumstances, whether they their career wise or whether it is in their own personal circumstances. So the, the nice thing about this topic is you can definitely, you know, I've written it from the perspective of you doing work at an organization, a company, whatever your profession is, but it actually could apply to your personal venturing also, whether that be thinking about your career path and how you define your career path. Uh, it, it, it has multiple applications. I use, uh, I try to think this way in my personal life with my wife and kids as much as I do in my professional life. So, so hopefully you find some universal application from that perspective. A uh, little bit of background on me, uh, I'm Scott Helm, I'm a faculty member here in the Block School, uh, but my principal responsibilities are twofold. One, I run our executive MBA program, and I also am an administrative leader of our nonprofit outreach center, the Midwest Center for Nonprofit Leadership. And so I spend about 40 to 50% of my time out in the community, either doing professional workshops for companies like Commerce and H&R Block, or for nonprofit organizations and consulting. And my, my favorite job I ever had was doing, and still continues to this day, is that I am the consultant for the Kansas City Royals on their Urban Youth Academy. So I still engage with them quite a bit. And for a sports fan slash fanatic, uh, it's been a really cool gig to have and relationships to build. So that's kind of just the the thumbnail on me. And what what you'll find is that a lot of what I talk about is strongly related to the practice of design thinking and the problem definition and why it's so important definitely has a foundation in that space as well as in many other types of management thinking. So, you know, let's Hopefully there's some interaction going on here. Uh, it's not just me talking, that would be even difficult for me to take for an entire hour. And so I don't have a ton of material to present. What I'd like to do is kind of just lay out a couple of things and then maybe we can all start talking and then maybe lay out a couple more things and we can talk more. And I'm just kind of curious to see where you all are and how you approach situations. And so really the first opportunity for you all to engage is here, which is, you know, not, it's not really your fault. It's kind of the fault of people like myself and higher ed institutions like the Block School and UMKC for why we start with solutions. From the time you were probably in kindergarten uh, all the way up until where you are in your studies today, people are always getting on people about what's the solution, what's the solution, what's the solution. And unfortunately, if we start with a solution instead of actually taking the time to understand the problem, then all of our biases, all of our you know, prejudging, our, our current misconceptions about how the world works, as well as the accurate perspectives on how the world works, get put into the problem. And if that's the case, then we really don't have any flexibility in how we attack that problem, right? So oftentimes you will hear people say, when they actually articulate what a problem is, they'll say the problem is we need more money. The problem is I need more staff. The problem is I need more time. Well, that's actually not a problem. That's actually, you're just restating a solution. And one of my favorite movies, I've already kind of divulged that I like sports, but one of my favorite movies of the last 10 years is Moneyball. I read the book also. And I, there's a great scene where Brad Pitt's talking to his scouts and he said, and he's like, what's the problem? And they all start rattling off the problem in the form of a solution. Like we need, uh, you know, we need to replace 30 home runs, 300 batting average, yada, yada, yada. Right. And then someone else says, we need to replace Jami or we need to replace this player. And he's like, no, that's not, he's like the pro. And then he goes about and reframes what the problem actually is. And the, the reason I bring that story up is it's a great illustration. And from business, the world of you know sports business in this example, but it's a great example of how if the Oakland A's in that scenario would have continued 
to define the problem as the solution, in this case, replacing Giambi or replacing the number of home runs, they never would have been able to turn the corner and build the kind of franchise they wanted to build because all they would have been doing is following a path that continued to be beset by failure and loss. They didn't have the money to compete with other Major League Baseball teams for free agents. They couldn't afford a Giambi. They couldn't afford, in the, today's day and age, a Mike Trout in free agency. And so they're st- framing the problem as the solution actually framed them out of actually being able to compete in the world of Major League Baseball. And so we do this all the time. You know, if you're a higher ed institution, the problem is we need more students. Eh, that's not actually the problem. That's the solution. Uh, if you're a student and you're looking to transition into the workforce, the problem is I need a job. Is that really the problem or is that the solution to the problem? And, and so there's a lot of utility in getting to what the actual problem is. And so I said you would have an, an opportunity to kind of weigh in here. And I'm actually curious of how this hits your ear, this idea that are, do you relate to the idea that sometimes when given a problem or when asked to define a problem, you start with a solution? So without it being a rhetorical question, I'd ask, does anybody have any reflection on that? I can see your name, so I can just call on you too. Well, I guess I'll um, I've never thought of it that way before. Um, I feel like that's actually really helpful for, um, I guess, like maybe coming up with different solutions you wouldn't have originally. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't think of like a specific example right now, but I like that. Are you currently, uh, are you currently employed or do you have a, a job that you, a company you work for? Okay, I don't know if it froze or not. It froze on my end. Um, I'm sorry. Are, are you currently? Do you have? Are you currently employed? Yes, um, I work for the MU Extension as okay, an great. educator. Yeah. So right, there could be scenarios from an extension perspective that. Mm-hmm. Are, I know we do it at UMKC. We say we need more of this, or we need more of that, or we need mm-hmm. more. Of this. I mean, does that sound familiar in how people talk about problems sometimes at extension? Yeah, for sure. James, you hop back on here. Does, it, does any of this resonate with you? Yeah, a little bit. You know, I think it's, I, I kind of try to view myself and others um, that I work closely with that I know well as more optimistic than pessimistic. So um, you just you changing the wordage and messaging to, you know, here, here's, a, here's a solution. Let's start with that as opposed to, okay, here's a problem. Like, like you said, we need more students. Like, I mean, it's, it's not a, the problem is like not having the money the, the more students would bring in, not having them. But this clearly the starting starting with and using messaging that's more positive and optimistic, I think sets the tone for everybody or for the individual um, going forward that can really affect um, either positively or negatively the outcome of what you're trying to do. Yeah. So yeah, so I'm a little bit familiar with it. Not not, you know, I'm not a master. I haven't been around it a lot, but I'm vaguely familiar with it. Yeah, I think I and look, I mean none of us are masters, that's for that's for sure. I mean, and we're all prone to our own biases and how these things come come into play. Uh, the part of the other challenge is if we start with the solution, is that it could have been the right way, it could have been the right solution for a period of time, and we could have moved through that period of time. And you know, we're kind of in a scenario right now with COVID and and what will the new world look like on the other side of this quarantine. And the things that were solutions in January may not be solutions in August when we come to the other side of this. And I actually wanted to use this as an example of uh, the current COVID crisis. And as we think about the response plan, and as we think about defining things as solutions versus problems. And look, I'm not a public health expert. I'm not, you know, and, and it's always easy to be the Monday morning quarterback than the Sunday evening quarterback. But I do think there is some utility to think about how we've even had a conversation around response to COVID, right? And uh, the the public health response to COVID. And, and one of the ways I point out to that is as, th- as, as COVID started happening, 
all you re all I ever heard at least, and maybe there was more discussion back in back doors, but all we talked about the public discourse around this was we need to do X, Y, Z, right? Like the problem is disease spread. The problem is um, quarantine. Like people are, or the problem is people are out in public too much, or the problem is this versus if you think about the goal of disease spread or the goal of immunity, herd immunity, or what if we even got more broad, the goal of a sustainable country going through a pandemic in today's stage. We may have come up with different ways of looking at solutions associated with it. We may have prioritize some things over other things. And this isn't a political statement because I think we've all been kind of caught blindsided by this and we've all moved to a solution set versus a problem definition set um, as it relates to this. And so you end up with kind of widespread solutions that look exactly the same everywhere you go, like quarantine in New York, quarantine in Kansas City, quarantine in South Dakota, quarantine in Hawaii, Alaska, yada, yada, yada. Um, one way you could have reframed it is, you know, disease spread, you know, for vulnerable populations. And do you just quarantine people who are vulnerable and then create herd immunity and everybody else? I don't know if that would work. Don't know. If, but I don't know if we even got the opportunity because I don't to even explore those different solutions because the problem was just stop it. We have to stop it like right now. Uh, and I think that's an interesting, you know, that's a very global situation of this. But as you think about things that happen in your companies, as you think about things that happen in personal life, as I think about things going on right now in higher ed and the different and nonprofit sector spaces where I work, we, you know, how do you get to a problem definition that's at the heart of what your value proposition is at a, as an organization versus what's more of the solution? Right, so a lot of the nonprofits I work with, the problem they see in COVID is how do I, how do I get money? Well, that is, I get it. Right, I, I get money's important. I like money a lot. Uh, that's not necessarily the problem, though. The the problem might be you know better defined a different way from the perspective of donors, from the perspective of end users, of uh, of from the perspective of customers things along those ways. And, and I think as we can rearrange our mindset to those orientations, uh, we get more creative uh, opportunities for, for solving problems. So, so what is a problem definition? And I, I kind of pieced together uh, from other talks I've done, uh, a, a brief kind of model of how we could potentially think about this. And, and part of what I'm, I'm working from here is is the idea that I, I forget who even the quote is attributed to but it's a problem you know a problem well defined is is half solved right and so a critical part of any solution set is a good problem definition and you know the idea here is good problems good problem definitions are ones that can break down whatever you're dealing with into actionable pieces Right, it's not terribly useful to just have global problems. Like uh, they they don't become meaningful, and solutions tend to be minimalized. Right, if you think of something like a global warming, uh, it's not meaningful to people. Right, uh, if you if you can't break it down into an actionable piece, some actionable problem that people can relate to, it becomes it becomes far less meaningful. Uh, somebody may have put something in the chat. So I will pause for one moment. Oh, thank you. Thank you, James. That is correct. Charles Keatering. Um, and the idea again though, right, is that problems that are easier to solve are ones that have meaning to the people who are trying to solve them. And also meaning to the people you're trying to solve them for, right? So if you're a company like a bank right now, you know, who are you trying to solve problems for? Right. Obviously, your shareholders may be in there. But if I want to keep a business going, I need to solve problems for my customers. Like what are if I want to innovate in this space, if I want to continue to grow and, and, and survive, I need to find a way to make sure I've been able to identify what the problem is for the people I, I serve who pay me. But I need to solve their problem, not my problem. And if I solve their problem, then 
I will get to that piece of more money. So if I go back to the school example of I need more students, that's not really, that's the solution. What I need to solve for is what are the barriers to prevent people from joining the programs that I want to grow? If I solve that problem, I get to my solution of more students. Do you see, it's, it's a little semantical, but in some ways it is the more optimistic approach, right? It's not just, I'm not framing everything as having to have more students. I'm framing things from the perspective of, here's a real problem I can solve. And if I'm solving it, then I get to the outcomes that I'm, that I'm trying to, to, to achieve. Right, so I need to eventually, I need to get to a place where I can creatively begin to piece together a puzzle that gives me the whole picture. And that's what these, that's what problem statements are really about. So here's my, anytime I do problem statements and I was just, I, I, fortunately for me, in the midst of this COVID stuff, I have a, I have a, my, consulting work has, has grown significantly. So that's a benefit, right? You get, you get lucky that eventually the world catches up to you and, uh, or you, you find yourself in just the right place at the right time. And a lot of the organizations I work with are looking to help try and reframe the world they live in in such a way that they can for survival purposes. And so for the last two weeks, and I will again on Friday, I've been, I've been working with the Royals about looking at their programs as it relates to their charitable functions and you know we've been doing a lot of this and we have long conversations and the conversations never are what are your problems the conversation starts with what's our value proposition right this is who we are this is why we exist and then from there i say you know who are your users what are their pain points what kind of insight can we gain from that right and so the you know in in the case of what the urban youth academy is doing the user is mainly is our, our kids who are interested in baseball. And that may seem pretty generic, but let me tell you part of the conversation we had is that it's not all kids. They aren't ready from a value proposition perspective to begin to look at all kids. They're looking, they only exist to serve people who have an interest in baseball. Now that interest could be crazy, like baseball fanatic, to, eh, that, be, that seems interesting, I'd like to try that. But they, that's, their, that's their market, right? That's it right there. And then from there, we started talking about, well, what are, those, what are the problems those people have? And what was really interesting about the conversation we had with them, and maybe I'm a little too nerdy about this, but I really found it interesting, is that what we talked about is not how to get kids into baseball, but we talk about the pain points they have. And what the big pain point they have is baseball has more failure than most other sports, right? So I played soccer and basketball in, um, through college. And those are two sports that have very little failure compared to baseball and golf. And which is probably the reason that I was able to do those two versus other sports. And the, when you think about like baseball, a good baseball player fails seven out of 10 times they come to the plate to hit. A good baseball player. An average baseball player fails almost uh, eight out of 10 times. A little, a little better than eight out of 10 times. Well, when you're a kid, you don't like to do something that you fail at a lot. And so one of the things that came out in the conversation was that you know kids who are interested in baseball enter a system that is already biased to against those who don't have good adult like adult engagement in their lives. And the reason for that is kids who what we found is that kids who stay in baseball typically have parents in the house or somebody in there some type of adult role model in the house who's encouraging them through the failure, who's preventing them from saying I had a bad experience, I'm going to quit. Right? They're they're helping them kind of fight through the the discouragement that comes with not doing something. And so all of a sudden our problem, like how we, the solution set that we begin to get to look at now is different than just talking to kids about baseball, right? It's, it's now we need solutions and strategies that'll begin to attack what the real problem is, which is there are, you know, disproportionately in baseball, if you look at it today, only about 6% of all baseball players are, non-white uh or yeah non not are african-american 
Uh, so in the U.S., the vast majority of baseball players that are kids are, it's, it's mainly a sport that takes place in the white communities. And, um, and there are a variety of reasons for that. One big reason for that, candidly, is cultural, right? Like it's just, you know, there are other sports that are better and easier. One is, uh, not better and easier, but better and easier to play in urban environments than baseball. Um, you know, it's easy to walk down to a court and shoot a basket. Um, there aren't a lot of well-kept baseball fields in urban environments, no matter where you live. I mean, I used to live just off the plaza. I was telling Maggie, uh, there was a baseball field down the road from where we lived, but I mean, it was, it was a patch of grass um, more than anything else. Uh, there are other, the economics of baseball are expensive, but one of the things, and so there, there's no doubt that that's a piece to the puzzle too, but a lot of it is, is that baseball doesn't have a history in, in these environments. But one of the things that we really zeroed in on also is that, and this, is, we, this isn't a socioeconomic thing because it's true in the suburbs too. Baseball tends to be played by kids who have parents who played sports because they're used, they, have a, they have a knowledge set on how to work through failure. Right, so I played sports, my wife did not. My kids play baseball, not because I was a fanatic about baseball, but because, <laughs> largely because um, I'm able to talk to them about the failure associated with those sports that she wouldn't be necessarily as inclined to um, coming out of the gate. Now, now she would easily because I was able to relate it to things that she did. But I'm the same way with other activities that kids, my kids would do. Like, I don't necessarily understand a lot of the fine arts uh, types of programs that kids do. My wife was a uh, violinist. And so she can talk to them about that, that I can't. And we were, but together, we've been able to kind of compare about these failure experiences. I've rambled. My point here is that baseball is one, for the Royals, what they found is the real problem set is that people don't know how to, a lot of parents don't know how to engage with sports unless they themselves played sports. So the problem we will go about solving is making it more democratic for all kids, no matter what their home environment is, no matter what the situation is. We never would have gotten to that type of solution set if we would have just said, more kids need to play baseball and it's just economics, so we'll buy everybody a glove. You know, that's, that wouldn't have gotten us there. If it was just, we need more money so that we can provide more supplies to kids, we wouldn't have gotten because there are, there are deeper pain points involved. And so when you write a problem statement for your own situation, think about who the end user is. Make it human, make a problem human. Think about what the need of that human is and is there an insight you can attach to it, right? Those are the, that, you can write very formulaic problem statements that will ultimately help you lead to better solutions. So my question to you all is, What's in your toolbox for how you analyze problems today? Like when you're given a problem, what do you think about? What do you draw on? We use a lot of data in our office. So whether that's placement data, utilization data, um, we're, we're constantly looking at, um, at the numbers to make decisions and to plan future programming. Good. Others? Yeah, data is big as well. Uh, that's a good point, Maggie. And also, when I, when, when I see a problem or a potential solution, I also try to do a little bit of research and look at other similar situations, how, they, how other, another person or another group went at it. And, and to see if that's a viable solution or a viable path um, or if that by looking at other uh, options that that will spark a new one that hasn't been tried before. Great. Um, I guess for my job I would say research. Um, all the curriculum that we teach is research-based and so like, I might have problems with like teaching a certain age group and there's already research about like what that age of kid like responds best to and um, ways to like maybe make them engage that other groups wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Hey Scott. Hey. Hey, fortunately for me, um, working in higher education, the higher ed space is pretty collegial and they will share how they've handled certain issues and things that are going on. And so reaching out to fellow colleagues to kind of see, get a sense of, you know, what's working, what's not, those are some of the things that I try to do as well. Brianna or Taylor? 
may not even be here. Those are all great, right? And our, our, our associate dean, Brian Anderson, would love that everybody said data. Um, if you haven't had the chance to talk to Brian Anderson, I guarantee you data will come up at some point in that conversation. And data is, data is critically important. Uh, I, and I, most of my research, uh, actually almost all my research has been quantitative, so I actually like a lot of quantitative data as well. Uh, the one problem with data, if it's quantitative, and is that it can be backward looking, right? So uh, if I'm thinking of trends, if I'm using trend data and I'm in a new environment, and this is one of the issues with COVID, candidly, you know, if we if we base COVID on other flu-like illnesses, we're going to come up with conclusions that are potentially off, right? Because it's not exactly, it's novel. The fact that it's novel means that we need data that is also consistent with the novel nature of it. And so uh, the idea that uh, people mentioned about talking to other, other similar service providers, organizations, companies, all good. I think one of the things that's extremely useful as you try and frame a problem, talk to the people who are experiencing the problem, right? As much as you possibly can, right? Talk to the, you know, in the case of the Royals that I was using, talk to parents, talk to kids, talk to people who drop out of things. Um, you know, James, who do you work for? Um, I, I'm currently unemployed. Um, I, I was working with the UMKC School of Medicine um, prior to um, the, the new year changing over. Very good. So, right, like, so many of us have a higher ed perspective, right? So when I think of growing programs in that space, you know, when I took over the executive MBA program, the first thing I did was talk to companies and go and talk to, I talked to alums, but I also talked to companies and I talked to prospective students of what they wanted in a program. Like, what would that program look like? That's also data, right? And look at it from a variety of, of perspectives. Uh, one of the things that this quote kind of gets to is there is a faculty member at UMKC who's recently retired, Lee Bowman. Um, many of you if in the Block School have read his book, The Four Frames, uh, Bowman and Deal. And as, whether you use the four frames model or not, the idea of framing problems from different perspectives perspectives is incredibly valuable, right? And what it really gives us is the ability to step out of our dominant frame of how we look at things and think about things from other perspectives. And that what I, I have included in here is you know, a tool you could use. I assume Maggie will give you guys the PowerPoints if you want them. Um, this is just kind of like a little worksheet that you could work from. And in this case, I've, I've included four frames, and these are the frames that Bowman talks about, right? So they are a structural frame, a human resource frame, a political frame, and a symbolic frame. And so when I talk about a structural frame, what I'm generally talking about is looking at the problem from the perspective of processes, efficiency, economy, allocation of resources to achieve the greatest efficiency, right? Great way to look at things. If you think about the COVID response and you think about the problem of providing classes online, you know, the structural piece would be how many computers do we need for professors to take home and staff to take home? What's the digital infrastructure? What is, you know, what are those kind of structural pieces? What's the process gonna be like for engaging with people? On and on and on, right? It's, it's those tactical pieces. Great, good, important to any problem. Human resources is gonna look at and say, how is James feeling about this search, certain situation? Like, what does this mean for him? What does this mean for his ability to focus on, on his schoolwork? What does it mean for his learning? What does it mean for any of us for how we're feeling about, we, James and I were talking a little bit before, I'm an introvert, he's a little bit more on the extrovert side of the scale. What does it mean for the lack of personal, like physical engagement that we're having in this environment? What does that mean? How does that influence our definition of what the problem is? Political gets into a scarce resource discussion, right? So the idea behind political is, you know, what are the different sides 
fighting for power in this new environment, right? So depending on where you're sitting depends on, on how you're looking at things. I mean, there has to be of someone at the University of Phoenix when this happened that like hit their knees and started crying with joy in the, in the hope that they were saying, we're here, we've been in this space, we've been in this space. We're, the, the playing field, the arena has been restructured and we have a new advantage. Um, that's only true if you look at things from a structural perspective, ironically, because the only thing that has changed where they may have an advantage is structural delivery versus other aspects of a higher ed experience, but neither here nor there. Uh, but the political side would say, who are the different, what are the different sides here? And, and so candidly in a higher ed environment, I would say the students are one coalition, faculty are another coalition, administrative or administration's another coalition, student support services like the role Maggie plays is another coalition. How, what is the battle that's going to take place now in this new environment from, you know, what are those different coalitions gonna look at so that I can understand the problem from that kind of game perspective, that battlefield perspective. And then finally is, is the symbolic. And, you know, we readily value, like the symbolic is so critically important to so many parts of our lives, right? Like, we wear caps and gowns and, and participate in Gilded Era rituals for graduation, right? Ceremonies are critically important. Uh, the, the way our buildings look, the way our classrooms look, uh, the, the, the things that when I say university to any of you, images pop into your mind, right? Those symbolic pieces and what it means in this changing environment has to be evaluated, right? And it's not something that can be fixed from a structural perspective. You can't structurally remedy the symbolic aspects of value that people get in, in any situation. And again, I'm sticking to higher ed because it's at least a shared experience that people have. And so my first question for you all is, do, does anybody on here have familiarity with this four frames model? Have any of you gotten it? I was on one of your talks a couple weeks ago. I'm um, sorry. So I got it that day. <laughs> so, so sorry. At least it's consistent. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Uh, repetition is nice sometimes for helping yeah. you figure it out. I, yeah. I, Scott, I have read, I mean, Professor Helm, I have read the- no, Scott's uh, better. Okay, Scott, the, uh, I've read the uh, Four Frames textbook. Yeah. Front, front to back and a uh, lot, lot of valuable information in there. Um, I think you can kind of start to pinpoint kind of some of the places and things that you hold most dear in your own kind of where you're at, you know, human resources frame versus political and things like that too. So you start to kind of get a sense of how you come at things too um, with, with their, their strategies and their structure here. Uh, we, we read it last summer and my, um, I'm earning a doctorate right now and we read, uh, Dr. Bullman's book and use this a lot to tackle how to solve some of the high level educational leadership problems that uh, myself and my classmates face. It's really, I think, really useful. James, are you familiar with it? Yeah, this was referenced in my leadership for public service class with uh, Dr. Faroff uh, my first semester last year. We didn't read the entire book front to back, but we read a good portion of it and we, we tackled all four um, you know, platforms here that you mentioned. So I have a, a yeah. bit of a familiarity. Great. Hey, Scott. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is Taylor. Um, I took, was fortunate enough to take um, Dr. Bowman's classes last year before he retired. And so I uh, learned it from the man himself. Very cool. Yeah, he's great. Uh, and I'm, in, I'm, putting it here in front of you, and I, it's very consistent with how he talks about it, is this is very useful for how you develop a strategy to understand a problem, right? So if you, if you kind of go back to that, you know, what, what goes into a strategy or goes into that problem user need insight, right? You think about the frames, whether it be structural, human resource, political, uh, symbolic, and Put your put the users through those different frames, right? Like so, you know how how are they thinking about it structurally? How are they thinking about it politically? 
How are they, what are the symbolic aspects? And then as you talk to them, you can listen for these different perspectives, right? Uh, the idea from the value from a framing uh, orientation is that what you're doing is you're first recognizing that you have biases and that what the frames give you a, a tool from a tool perspective, what they give you is a way to minimize at least or mitigate the impact of your biases as you try and understand the problem, right? Because we all have them, right? I'm, I'm, I'm trained as an economist. I mean, all my biases are wrong. My, my favorite joke about economists is they've successfully predicted nine out of the last five recessions, right? I mean, we're always predicting recessions. Uh, you know, so if I don't want to think like an economist for a minute, then I need other tools that help me put my mind in a different perspective. And the, the idea here from, that I'm introducing with the frames is that as you think about problem definitions, think about bringing a different perspective to it so that you can get a more holistic view of what the problem is. Right, so where is the, the, the goal of this ultimately? Is to get to better solutions, right? I mean, that's the real goal. And the way we're gonna get to better solutions is if we have a, a, a more accurate and candidly, a, a more, a broader problem perspective than the one that we may walk into with the solution already in mind. So I guess I would throw back to you all, are there problems that you all are thinking about today that you can begin to apply some of the content we're talking about on here? Most definitely. Um, as I mentioned, I wasn't employed, but the reason for that is I'm running for state office this year for state representative here in Missouri in the Northland and uh, with the, running a campaign um, normally and also during this COVID time, there's, you know, there's many a problem that I, this can be applied to, whether it's voter outreach, fundraising, um, just trying to stay viable and relevant in, in a world that where everyone's kind of stuck at home. So, you know, you know this you know, changing of you know, mindset of problem to solution uh, can be definitely applied to a lot of different aspects of the campaign. Yeah, and from a political perspective, it's actually quite useful strategy in politics in that you're never pinned down on a solution. Oh, for sure. Definitely. <laughs> right. <laughs> Definitely. But, I mean, in fairness, right, if you look at the last presidential cycle and you look at people, or you look at successful politicians, not just uh, successful in winning elections, but both winning elections and otherwise, what they really are very, very good at is expressing problems. Right, so whether it be Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump, um, and they, they both were especially good at articulating a problem set for a segment of the population that traditionally had been left behind, right? And what I'm talking about is that white working class group um, that hadn't had a pay raise since the 1970s. And in fact, they were so good at it <laughs> And they talked about it, and they were talking to the same group. There's like 15 or 20% of their block that goes between the two of them, which I know seems crazy from a policy perspective, but they relate to the problem that is being offered by the politician, right? It's not necessarily about the solution that matters to people. What actually matters is do they feel like you understand their plight, right? This is where empathy is so important to all management and leadership. And this, you know, this problem statement approach comes from an empathetic perspective, which is, do, does the person talking understand my personal circumstances and pain point? Or are they just giving me a cookie cutter solution that is their idea and they don't really care about me whatsoever? Other people thinking about problems or, or ways they could begin to think about applying some of this. Um, I mean, the problem I'm dealing with right now is I can't go into classrooms anymore and teachers are so overwhelmed. Like they might have kids of their own that they're worrying about or the parents. So I don't want to be an extra burden like, oh, you're teaching them all these other things here. Let's talk about nutrition too. But it's also something people might be able to worry about more now um, because they're cooking all their own meals and like trying to find food on a budget. 
and trying to find the perspective of how to approach that, like to present it to those people so that it's useful, but not like annoying to them. Mm -hmm. um, so do you teach nutrition? Yeah. Oh, very cool. Probably could have had one of these hours useful for that. We could probably all benefit from that as we're home eating snacks and people are consuming way too much alcohol right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, that, no, so that's a good point. So what your birth, so who are you teaching to? Are you teaching to uh, people who take a class through extension or are you teaching to other faculty? I'm, I'm curious. Um, mostly elementary school kids in Jackson County. Oh, wow. Um, I can teach some adults and I feel like that might be more who I would go towards now. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly I've done like kindergarten through second. Great. And so, yeah, so, I mean, I don't know, again, the solution isn't important at this point, but when you start thinking about the problem, uh, it's actually, you know, what are their pain points? Like, what are kindergarten through second grade pain points? What are the family members' pain points? And you're right, you don't want to be an additional burden, but there actually could be unique opportunities where what you provide is a solution for them, not just nutritionally, but activity-wise, right? Like, I have three kids, seven, four, and two. And our seven, five and two, he just turned five yesterday. Um, and, you know, we're always looking for stuff for them to do. Right? And so you start thinking about, and if it, if it involves them being able to be better preparing their own meals, my wife and I are winning, right? In that sense, right? That's, that's one less errand I have to run upstairs, after, you know, and do throughout the course of the day. Not really an errand, but parenting. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's like, who's the user that you can, you can alleviate? pain for is it maybe it's not even the second grader through kindergarten or in this environment maybe it's the family at home right who needs things for their kids to do um and then thinking about it from how can you do it in a way that doesn't add to their burden i mean there's all these memes all over the internet and i'm not ridiculing teachers uh i'm sure they have you know they're struggling too but the idea that parents who are now working from home have time to also be teachers right of their kids in reading and math and things it's just it's just really there's a ton of memes like oh yeah i got this i uh I'll, I'll do my regular job and also do the educating portion and that's not what we're really being asked to do as parents but it feels like that if there's not a communicate if if the problem isn't expressed accurately taylor we don't know that much about you uh, i'm curious where where you are and uh who you work for or what kind of problems you're looking at right now? Yeah, uh, I work for Cerner. Oh, great. Um, and I'm in their IT outsourcing organization. Uh, and right now focused on supporting a client uh, just outside of New York City. Um, and so uh, New Rochelle is within Westchester County and the hospital support is, is within that uh, county there. Um, and so a problem is, is how do you provide testing to patients uh, limiting exposure to clinical staff and RIT staff while also um, making sure that we're still providing the support that they need um, all while revenue for hospitals is declining and um, everybody's this heightened sense of uh, uh, change. So um, that's, that's the current uh, problem. That, that scenario there um, and uh, how do you limit the exposure of my team that's supporting end user devices there and if somebody was to get infected um, how how do we ensure that there is part of the team that can still go and and do do the work that we need to do yeah new, Ro new rochelle is where the new york breakout started isn't it yep um the yeah, so from what you, you, you had Dr. Bowman's class, uh, I'm arguing here that you use the frames to help create a good problem statement. Do you, do you see utility in using the frames and what you learned from him and in, in building a problem statement for this scenario? Oh, for sure. And, and it would it'll vary from the end user. So whether it's my, my team or the clinical staff or the hospital leadership, um, depending on who we are working with, framing what my team's problems are in a way that then is relatable uh, 
for the whoever we are I'm talking to is has been extremely helpful not only here but in uh, uh, other responsibilities that I have and then certainly in, in personal life too yeah yeah and I'm glad you brought up the user aspect of this because in a in a very like sterile academic environment right I say who's the user who's the in any in any line of work right whether it's the educator, the the IT at Cerner, the educator here, um, and I'm pointing to myself, um, James's work in public office, uh, in pursuit of public office, you're gonna have more than one end user, right? Like the, we don't live in a world where every single person is the same. And so the exercise of going through it for multiple end users and not making the mistake of saying, it's easier if I just try and generalize across all my users. Because it's just not realistic, right? They all there's different problem sets depending on who the user is. And if you take if you don't take the time to look at it from that perspective, then what you're going to probably do is go back to what we did talk about at the very beginning is you're just going to give them a solution. Like, you know what, here's what you should do. Here my problem is not enough people. So if I use Taylor as an example, you know, the problem is not enough, you know people at using our platform in New Rochelle. Okay, great, so more people will use the platform. That doesn't actually remedy what the actual dynamics of the problem are from both a fear, symbolism, all the other things that we've been talking about. Is that fair, Taylor? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there's a significant difference between nurses versus physicians versus hospital administrative staff to the CEO, the CFO, um, dealing with, with them, they require different levels of detail, different, uh, they relate to different things. And, um, and this time where everybody's on, on edge, um, it, it's all of them kind of vary in the way that I found that has been effective in how I interact with them. Yeah, we actually have to reset to some degree in times like this. And this is true in any time we encounter a new environment. Hopefully they're not all so dramatic as this, that we reset how we're ultimately going to get to our what our goal may be, which is sales growth or votes or number of people we're educating. Um, there are different paths to get there. And the, to, I, I guess the, the thesis of my comments today are the only way you actually can get there in a meaningful way and in a in a way that you can you can make course adjustments is if you start with an accurate definition of what the problem is because you could get lucky you could start with a solution throw it out there and it could hit and get lucky but that's just going to further reinforce the bias for the next time it doesn't hit you're going to be lost but if you have a problem statement and you solve that problem and it reinforces that then you, even if it doesn't fully solve it to the way you want to, you can make course adjustments along the way in the solution set that allows you to get better and better and better at solving that problem and gives you more and more data. So there are questions. Comments or criticism? Maggie's back. I'm not here to criticize or ask questions. I thought it was great. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. yeah it was my pleasure. You know, it's an interesting way to do this versus, uh, obviously, we're all in the new world versus if we were in person in some of those places. Uh, I will give these, send these over to you, Maggie. You guys can use the deck for whatever you want to. Um, Thank you. One of the, that last slide, if you want to use it as a worksheet, you're welcome to do that also. Uh, where you just write a problem at the top and i'm at the university well i'm not at the university I, i'm employed at the university uh and i'm in front of a computer a lot so if any of you have any questions or anything you want to follow up with me feel free to uh happy to hop on a zoom chat or anything else with anybody as they work through things um best of luck as you continue to push forward with whatever you're doing <laughs>